Hello and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of good gardening advice. If you'd like to submit a question to our panel, you can dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Our email address is byf at unl.edu. We do answer those questions on future shows. Please attach those pictures as JPEGs. Give us as much information as you can, including where you live. Don't forget to check out our social media sites during the week on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest. Jody, you have a poster and dead spiders. Yes, I'm trying to be creative here. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so I've got samples of brown recluse spiders and Nothing's alive, don't you worry. <laughs> um, but I know that there was a question a couple weeks ago, maybe a lightning round, someone wanted to know how to identify a brown recluse spider. And it's, uh, it's a great thing to know because there are so many spiders out in the garden right now and sometimes spiders do come inside the home. Um, the ones in this box are, they used to be alive, brown recluse spiders. You can see they're brown, nothing super special about them. This one's on a glue board that someone brought into my office this week. And that's a good way to catch them. Uh, if you've got any glue boards, uh, you can get them at the hardware store. It could say spider, it could say anything else, but you can just put it underneath something. Uh, they're recluse, so they're not gonna be out in the open. They're not gonna be hanging out in webs or anything. Um, but they, so some identifying characters. I'm gonna hold up my poster now. Hopefully you can see it. So that's the size. Um, this one is actually a brown recluse on my finger a few years ago dead, don't worry. But you can see <laughs> that fiddle that people talk about or that violin shape and it's gonna be yeah, on that cephalothorax, right? So the string part, or not the handle, is gonna be like, you know, closer to the, the top part of its uh, face. Cephalothorax, yes, yeah, so that's where the fiddle is. Um, but you can see there's no spines or stripes on those legs. They're pretty plain. It's a very plain looking spider. So if you see a spider that's got stripes or spines, that's not a brown recluse. And that abdomen, it's pretty uniform in color, a brown color. And then the other picture just shows the eye arrangement. So most spiders, if you magnify or look closely, they're gonna have eight eyes. The brown recluse spider has six eyes arranged in dyads, which are in pairs in this particular arrangement. There are some spiders that have six eyes, but they are clumped together and they're not in this arrangement. So don't panic if you see a spider, but there are ways to identify a brown recluse. We are, in this part of Nebraska, um, we do have brown recluse spiders, so don't panic. Um, it's usually the, south, uh, the southeastern part of Nebraska um, and then um, southern states and through the Midwest. But, um, Definitely don't panic, but it is one of the uh, more medically important spiders that we have. So, um, you know, like what we do when we're gardening, we just shake out our boots and shoes before we put them on and some of our clothes. But again, they're recluse, and so they don't really wanna be around us just as much as we don't wanna be around them. Perfect, thanks, that's a cool way to identify. Okay, Bill, you have plugs of turf. Yeah. <laughs> I have two different plugs that I pulled from our research plots on East Campus. We had our field day yesterday and uh, after that I took some, some plugs. Um, one of the things I talked about was, was brown patch and, and you know some factors that can be important for brown patch formation in tall fescue lawns. But what I really want to talk about today here is just notice a difference in height. This one on this side is very tall. Over here, not as tall. They were mowed at the exact same time. So what is going on here? Is it a different fertilizer? No, we put down plant growth regulators. So this is what I really study. Um, this is why I'm really bad at weeds because I don't really study weeds. <laughs> I study how to manipulate plant growth rate. And um, so you can put certain things on your lawn that actually make the lawns grow slower and it actually improves the health of the plant when it's done correctly. Uh, and so if you're really tired of mowing your grass, one of the things you can do is you can hire a lawn care company and they could put you on a plant growth regulator program. They put down a product that's actually already in the plant and um, it just puts it at higher levels and that slows the growth rate down so you don't have to mow as much. And when you're doing that, you can reduce the growth rate by about 50%. So big reduction in our growth rate um, by doing that. And so. If it's something you're interested in, you know, reach out to some lawn care providers and see if they would put you on a program. 
um, to kind of minimize the mowing you have to do in your yard. Excellent. I actually like to mow, so I'm not going to do that. But you can still mow. <laughs> it only takes me 15 minutes. Well, I think the one thing homeowners do wrong more than anything is they don't mow frequently enough. Right. And so this is one way that if you're not going to mow frequently, at least you're not letting the grass get out of control. So gotcha. I think that it, it really can help, help improve health, too. Absolutely. That's cool. Yep. All right, Lauren, you have turf also tonight. Yeah, we're going we're to continue on uh, factors that you know, affect turf diseases. And one of the things that we're seeing more of right now with the cooler nights is dollar spots. So I have a sample here, uh, and this is uh, thanks to Bill and the, some of the cultivar evaluations that he has out in his turf area. But these are some different cultivars of bluegrass, but you can see on the different blades, these uh, little bleached out areas, that spots that go all the way across the blade, even some of the wider bladed ones like this, you can kind of see it, it's kind of pinched in the middle and shrivels on the edge. So this is all dollar spot. Here's one that even has some purple on the end of the lesion after, whoop, I dropped it, after the lesion uh, is formed. So you can kind of see that one. But all different types of responses to dollar spot, but all the same fungus. Now just to compare this to, I'm gonna show two different ones. Many of you had brown patch earlier this year, and this is a brown patch lesion next to a dollar spot lesion. So you can see how irregular that margin is on this one. Uh, it does in this case go across. They don't always go all the way across, but really irregular compared to that little pinched uh, lesion with dollar spot. So a couple we're seeing. Um, now again, uh, dollar spot more common with cooler nights. If it warms up again, you're gonna see brown patch active. Um, with uh, both of these, typically in a homeowner situation, it's not gonna be bad enough. You may have to do some reseeding. If you do uh, need to manage it, I wouldn't worry at this point about brown patch too much because it's going to cool off and it's going to go away. Uh, but dollar spot is one that also actually responds to nitrogen. So mm -hmm. that would be one. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, Kelly, a tree oh, sample. Okay. Yes, and I do have, have a, a question from somebody this week. So oh, I'm okay. glad you brought that one good, in. Good. Good. I do. This is a, it's a conifer. Uh, but it's kind of a unique conifer. It's a deciduous conifer. And so it loses its needles every fall. And that it's a, it's a common question that we get from people. It's like, I think my bald cypress is dying. All the needles are turning bronzy and they're dropping off, but that's normal. Uh, so we call this a deciduous conifer. It has the needle-like leaves, and this is a very fine textured, soft, uh, beautiful in the landscape. And these uh, round balls here are actually cones. Okay, they are cones, they have a round cone. So as a conifer, they have a cone. And this is a great tree for, uh, if you have really wet soil conditions, this is one tree that will tolerate the, those very wet soil conditions down in the south and it'll grow in swampy areas and it'll develop these knees that they call, we call them knees that pop up. But in Nebraska, I find that if once it's established, it's pretty drought tolerant as well. And it will do okay on sandy soils. All right. Bald cypress. Excellent, we have a beautiful couple specimens on campus. All right, pictures, and Jody, you know, the insect world is still a buzzing, so you have quite a few of them. Your first one tonight is on tomatoes. Um, so there's a couple of them on there. He, they don't appear to do much. He just kind of wonders, are they good guys or bad guys? They're neither, but they're mating. <laughs> <laughs> they're mating on tomatoes. Those are stilt bugs. And they're pretty interesting because they look like they're on stilts. They're, their six legs are super skinny and long, and then they've got long antennae as well. They're neither good or bad. They, they'll feed on sap usually. So I kind of just let them do their thing maybe. All right. Your second one is actually a Blair viewer. She wonders what's happening to her tomatoes and how she prevents it from continuing or how can she correct it? Okay, so these tomatoes, don't look that great. It kind of opens it up to, it, look, it could be a tomato hornworm and, and bugs get, can get in there, mm -hmm. but they, that may be from water, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's too much or too little. So right. It correct. could be growth cracks, right. Just, right. especially after the rains we've had, they take up so much water right. and they crack. Right, so when they are open up like that, then they're more susceptible to insects, but um, so preventative, <coughs> I don't know, different. Turn off right. the Mother Nature <laughs> Right, fountain. might not be able to be helped this season. Right. All right, and your third one here is a Norfolk viewer. Found this caterpillar. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So this is a type of hornworm. It's a spurge uh, sphinx or hawk moth larva. It is going to turn into a pretty cool sphinx moth. Uh, so I don't know if you've got enough spurge or the, the weeds there or shrubs that you can feed it, but uh, that's what it is. Very cool. All right. 
Bill, um, you, you do have a weed question, <laughs> okay. but this is one you can handle, I think. Hopefully. This, this is a Council Bluffs viewer. Um, wants to know what it is and how to treat it and when. Jody says she knows what it is. Know. We yeah. pretty much all know this yeah. one. It's ground ivy or creeping Charlie, and uh, this is one that we're constantly battling. Um, we're a little early on the treatment for it. It is a perennial, uh, and it's hard to kill in the summer, so we're going to want to go out with some kind of a combination product. Generally late September as the nights are getting cooler, we're getting some frost. I will get a better kill and if it's really bad infestation, um, you know, you might need two applications, products that contain things like triclopyr seem to work a lot better on, uh, on this particular guy. So look for a product that contains that active ingredient. All right, you also have a second picture of something and they're concerned that this is poison ivy in yeah. their lawn in Zresco. <clears throat> so how do you, is it? And yeah, do you um, it's another one too. It's a, all these woodier weeds, the triclopyr is gonna be uh, one of your better bets. And so getting that control with triclopyr, most of the kind of growth regulating herbicides will work on uh, on the poison ivy, but the triclopyr is gonna be even more effective and don't be like me in my tree ID class, IDing it like in my face. Cause <laughs> I had a really mean professor that didn't tell us to ID. It wasn't me. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm very allergic to it. I was very itchy, it. yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks Bill. Okay, you have um, issues associated with somebody who moved into a new house, Lauren. I Lots do have issues with someone that moved into a new house. Okay. What do they, they need have? they need you. They're noisy neighbors. They have lots of landscaping and lots of fruit trees. Their apples turned brown, but they sent us pictures of the peach tree in particular. Mm -hmm. The tree, the peach, uh, there is a slope with some irrigation. Uh, you've got three pictures here. What in the world is going on? So with the peach, and I, I believe I believe this is too, it looks like mm -hmm. uh, there's a common disease of our stone fruits called brown rot. And I believe if they look up images of brown rot, they're gonna see the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. That is something that you would wanna look at for a fruit tree spray schedule to try to alleviate that. Also, uh, you wanna make sure and use some sanitation to you know remove any branches that are infected to the point that you're killing twigs and branches. You can actually have this disease significant enough that you'll have cankers in the tree. Mm -hmm. So just some management with pruning could help you a lot. All right, and they did not send pictures of the apples, so they may need to do that. Most likely a different disease, uh, yeah. because apples, you typically wouldn't see brown rot in those, but you would see them in the stone fruits. All right, thank you, Lauren. You have a couple of tree issues, Kelly. Uh, the first is a bur oak that was blown into this leaning position. Okay. And this was only on the 7th of August, mm -hmm. seven, seven inch diameter. What are their options for straightening this one back up. Well, that, that's always a concern. And this tree, you know, if, if it survives, which it probably will, it's only going to get taller and bigger and, and that root system may be compromised. And I mean, it doesn't look like it, but when a tree leans after a storm, ice storm, um, and our soils are so wet this year in some, in some areas where there's been a lot of rain, so that can contribute to it as well. There may be damage to that root plate, even if you can't see it. And it's, it's really too large of a tree, I think, to try to pull back up and stake. People always want to do that. Um, but you might want to get a certified arborist out to take a close look at it. Um, but it, it is a concern. Unfortunately, we can't see below ground to see what actually happened. And that's why we sometimes recommend a certified arborist. But definitely, if you decide to keep it, be watching it very closely. If it fell, what is it going to hit? Right, and your second one is also a leaner. This is a dwarf apple tree in rural Council Bluffs, loaded with apples, leaning badly. So what should we do here? Well, again, that's a sign that maybe there was a root issue and then the weight of the apples caused it to start to lean. Maybe it's, again, if it's an area where there's been a lot of rain and our saturated soils, sometimes you have girdling roots and all that can lead to leaning or even wind throw. But it looks, it's probably a little bit, it's a smaller tree, it's not going to get to be a large shade tree like the oak tree, so you could try to uh, support it mm -hmm. with a piece of wood um, underneath it. Um, you could maybe try to pull it back and stake it, but it's probably at the age where if there is root damage, it isn't going to repair itself. Um, in the future with apple trees in June, late June, uh, do fruit thinning to try to take some of that weight off. Exactly, and they could take the weight off now by eating those yes. apples. Right. <laughs> so. 
You could even do some fruit thinning, remove some of the smaller ones. There you go. You know, with some of the craziest weather we've seen in a long time, maybe you have a tree that wasn't able to survive, and now you've got that stump to deal with. For our free first feature tonight, Jeff Culbertson gives us some tips on not only grinding those stumps, but planting a tree in the same space. So 2019 has been an interesting year. We've had floods, we've had heavy snow, lightning, tornadoes, high winds, you name it. And probably your trees may have suffered a little bit. You may be at that situation where you have a tree that's been damaged, uh, has died because of all the severe weather we've had or the unusual circumstances that 2019 has brought to us. If that's the case, after you've had the tree removed, and we've talked about this in previous weeks, having someone professional come in and remove, especially a larger tree, you may have to have the tree, the, the stump ground. And so that's a process using, again, you're gonna to wanna to contact uh, an arborist to come in with their stump grinder and grind the stump down. We wanna take the stump down as far as we can go, and depending on the machine, some go deeper than others and follow out any major roots and try to take some of those out. And you know, we'll talk about that uh, during the season as well, having the, the fruiting bodies in the lawn. And many times that's from decaying roots from a dead tree or a, a tree that's been gone for some time. So those roots will stay there a long time. So after we have that stump ground and cleaned up, we're gonna wanna take all that pulp, that, that uh, wood shavings that's mixed with the soil. We wanna take as much of that out as possible. Certainly, can be composted, it would make a good material for composting, so it's something that you can use, but you're not gonna wanna inject that right back into the soil. It's gonna rob your soil of nitrogen, and so that's something that we're gonna wanna clean that out. And then once that's cleaned out, we're, we'll come in with some good topsoil, maybe we'll mix in 20% compost in with that, uh, and so then we'll repair that area. At that point, you may decide that you want to plant a new tree. And certainly now as we go into August and September, we're in, in our second tree planting season of the year. So this is a good time to do that. You may be able to plant the tree in very close to the same spot that you had the previous tree, depending on the size of the stump. If it's a very large stump, really the suggestion is, even if it's been ground out, to move that you know, 15, 20 feet away from that area so that the new tree isn't gonna be impacted by the large root system of the previous tree. If it's a very small tree or if the arborist was able to grind out uh, most, if not all of the, uh, the previous root system and a good soil has been brought in and compacted and, and leveled to the right height, then you can look at bringing in a new tree and putting in very close to that same spot. Once you've got a in, it's good to monitor that since we have some new soil, so it may need additional watering or maybe some settling that happens over time. So you're gonna watch that particular place a little closer than you would an undisturbed part of your lawn where you've planted a tree. You know, we've encouraged you the past few weeks to go to a professional to handle those big jobs when it comes to your trees. That does include getting rid of that stump after it's lived its life. I have a neighbor who had a pin oak come down and the chainsaw has been going for about a week trying to cut that thing up. <laughs> All right, Jody, we have a bunch of pictures for you again. Imagine that. Okay. So this is a viewer who has, uh, he's in Wahoo. He has a bur oak, it's about five years old. He did send us a picture of the whole tree and the poor thing is, looks like this. So what is this and what does he do about it? Okay, so these little ball type things on that leaf, those are galls. The previous yeah. picture. Yeah, so that's, previous um, picture. So that's the bur oak, right? Mm -hmm. So that's oak flake gall. Mm -hmm. um, they're normally on the underside of the leaf. What's in there is a little developing wasp. So galls are formed by the plant because of the pest organism releases some kind of chemical that changes like pretty much the hormones or chemistry of the plant and so it does this um, and that's from a wasp so mm -hmm. if you cut that open there's a little wasp in, developing nothing there. to do it's mostly cosmetic so don't you know worry. I know you don't like it but there's not any chemical that you can use for it all right now the second one this okay. is on sumac yeah so this is an interesting kind of gall um, it is sumac gall aphid so if you cut one of those open they may be like hundreds of aphids in there so oh. there are not many aphid um, gall formers but aphids produce parthenogenically so without mating they just make clones of themselves so if you open that there'll be lots of aphids in there 
but again, you could maybe prune those out, but no chemical treatment for those. Okay, and the third one is in Norfolk, found this plant, which is an unusual plant to begin with, in a neighbor's yard. She she wondered what it was, but more importantly, what are the things on it? So okay. Yeah, so that's another type of gall, um, and this one is a willow pine cone gall because it looks like a pine cone, and um, if you open that up, that was actually um, made by a midge, which is a gnat, which is a fly, but that's what's developing in there. For most of these, it's pruning them out and um, just like if, if the leaves fall, the ones that have galls, rake those up and destroy them so that they're not there next year, but it's just cosmetic. Cool, and we have to thank our botanist in our department for figuring out that that was a willow and then going from there. All right, Bill, this is a rural Lancaster County viewer, has a fescue bluegrass mix, wonders what the lighter green grass, in quotes, <laughs> is that is taking over the yard. He sent this picture and uh, this is where the turf is thin and then he also sent this, which is, you know. Helpful, yeah. Helpful. Definitely, because yeah. it looks like crabgrass and, uh, and so when you have this and you can start identifying it, it seems like it would be uh, smooth crabgrass versus larger hairy crabgrass because they'd have hair all over it. So having this picture, you can really identify it. Crabgrass is gonna be really tough to kill right now. Um, frost is gonna be the best herbicide. Um, and so I see the lawn, it looks a little thin, and to me I think that's one of the problems. When we scalp our lawns and they're a little bit thin and we get the heat, then that soil starts to promote the, uh, the, uh, those summer annuals, crabgrass, foxtail, goosegrass, to fill those little voids. And so just trying to make sure that we're keeping a healthy lawn and we're not scalping it is gonna, uh, gonna do a lot to really keep the, these weeds out. But you know, frost is gonna be our best treatment here uh, sooner than later. All right, we want it later though. We, yeah. we need you didn't to say like <laughs> August 28th, right? So, yeah, no, okay. no right. it's not. All right, Lauren, you have a couple of different questions about clematis from a couple of different viewers. Uh, the first is a Lincoln viewer, looked great all summer and then all of a sudden it is doing this. No insects, no one is sprayed. What's going on here? This is, I believe this is clematis wilt, uh, which actually affects the stem. So in this case, it's a fungus that survives in the residue. So pruning this out, uh, following those those vines down to the base where they're being affected and pruning those out uh, is really the best thing to do at this point. You can use a fungicide uh, if that is for sure what it is, uh, but in general just prune out uh, is going to help a lot. It is favored by high humidity, which we've had. So. All right, oh. and your second one is, uh, this is a 19-year-old Jack Manii. She thinks this is iron deficiency. And it could be, these are really difficult. So this, you know, we go down the virus road of thinking it's possibly a virus. Uh, if it is iron deficiency, um, it is gonna respond to an iron treatment. So, you know, a, a fertilizer with iron uh, should give you some response. If you see this occurring every year and new growth comes out like this, then it's most likely a virus. Uh, you're not gonna do anything about that, but rogue it out. So I would just kind of watch the situation and see how it goes right. and enjoy it if it's still flowering. <laughs> All right. And your third one is leaves, but it's your favorite, it's a tree. Uh, this yeah. is a red oak, 20, 25 feet tall. She thought it was from Japanese beetles, but it's gotten worse and worse. There's some good news here. You really don't have to get the chainsaw out in this particular case, <laughs> um, so which I would like to get the chainsaw out a lot of times. But anyway, <laughs> in this one, uh, this is a, a I believe it's a fungal leaf spot of some sort. And, and all of our trees, many of them get leaf spots. Uh, things you can do, try to, to opening up the canopy if it's at all possible uh, to do some thinning, get some air circulation in there. If it's a smaller tree, avoiding overhead irrigation, uh, these types of things will help. But uh, really don't recommend a fungicide in this case. It's probably gonna do some minor damage. If it gets really extreme uh, and it's a younger tree, that's where you might consider a fungicide. All right, thanks Lauren. Okay, Kelly, this is a Wayne viewer okay. who has uh, a lot of rhododendrons. They're about 10 years old. They bloomed really well, but then they're doing this, kind of the whole line of them. He has put on three applications of neem about a week apart, and they get irrigated every other day. Okay, well, I think this looks like a root issue to me. When you have some of the leaves are rolling, you've got some chlorosis in there with the yellowing, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I don't think it's an insect, and Jody can agree, so I don't think the neem oil is helping. The biggest issue here is probably too wet of a soil. 
Mm -hmm. Rhododendrons like well-drained soil that's not too wet. Most plants like well-drained soils that are not too wet. So I would cut back on the every other day irrigation, definitely. There might, there's probably a root rod in there. If it's not too far advanced, maybe the rhododendron will recover and come back. But watch that excess watering. Every other day is probably too much on most anything. And if lawn irrigation happens to hit it besides that, then it's just too wet of a soil and leads to root rots. Every other day for your lawn is too much too. Right, so. exactly. <laughs> for, <laughs> exactly. And your, your next one, Kelly, is a lemon lace mm -hmm. elderberry. Um, this is an albium, and it was great until about three weeks ago, and then all of a sudden branches are curling up and dying. Mm -hmm. Shrub has plenty of water, west side of the house, late afternoon shade. Okay, well, it, there's the two stems there that are, looks like they're turning brown and declining and maybe wilting a little bit on the leaves. So I'm wondering with this one if it might also be just too wet of a soil and a root rot has gotten in there. Um, go ahead and prune out uh, those dead stems as they occur and check the soil. Um, make sure it's, if it's really wet and you have some mulch there, then pull that mulch and allow it to dry a little bit and then make sure you're just not watering. Um, lot, the soil needs to be moist. That soil never needs to be saturated. And this year, with all the excessive rain we've had in some areas, um, that would just contribute to it. Sometimes, it, if a plant is close to a downspout as well, just the water coming out of the downspout. So you, you have to be careful with those and make sure you select the right plants for those locations. And, you know, we don't know a lot about the hardiness of that particular right. cultivar yeah, either. Yeah, that's, so. that's another pen. Yeah. Uh, maybe the genetics of the lemonade lace. Maybe it's just not fully hardy here. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Kelly. Well, it's time to take a minute to head over to our garden to see about another All-America Great Selection. We've got quite a number of winners, and tonight Terry's going to show us something that might help you fill out those edges of your garden. Here's Terry James at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week at the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're continuing to look at some of our All-America Selection winners. We have one that's actually a regional winner, so not national, but works really well within our Heartland area. It's, the, it's a new nasturtium, so this one's called Baby Rose. It's a little more mounding than most nasturtiums that we're familiar with, so it stays a little more compact. It is an annual, it takes full to part sun, and takes dry to normal uh, soil conditions. It's actually doing pretty well within our backyard farmer garden. We have it kind of as an edger. I um, haven't seen a lot of loss on it, but it hasn't really bloomed a lot either since it's gotten super hot. It's dark green foliage, compact, only about 12 inches tall. It's supposed to bloom from summer to frost, uh, but we're again, we're not seeing that because of the heat, I think. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out our new nasturtium, Baby Rose. You know, and just so you know, you can also eat those nasturtiums. I don't think that's going to add to our total when donations come through, though, because, you know, those leaves don't weigh very much, and we're not going to pluck them off. You can also eat the blossoms and the seeds, peppery sort of a thing. All right, quick round of questions. Uh, Jody, this is a Waverly viewer that wants to use um, a product to control grubs, and it's a little late for that anyway, but it's one that uses BTG. Okay, that, that, yeah, I have. It's kind of a newly marketed mm -hmm. product. I don't know much research about it, and after talking to Bill, he doesn't really know too much either. And it's too and late. it's too late, so it's not the right time, so probably look into some research and then... Yeah, what we saw on before the show was, you know, it may be, it should be earlier, probably June, uh, late June. Okay, so. all right. So, Bill, this is a weed question, but if you have spurge in your yard of any sort, whether it's the leafy dreadful kind or the mm -hmm. prostrate, mm -hmm. is this a time to do anything to control that or are we a little too late? I usually just pull them. I mean, how, how much is there? <laughs> so in, we're on an acreage. Okay. Are you gonna pull all of it? No, I probably wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. That's anything. Hornworms. Those ones, the spurge. That's right, spurge hornworms would do yeah. that. See, so. biocontrol. <laughs> so we need to start breeding those in hey. etymology. Mm -hmm. All right, so Lauren, on that note, this is a viewer that also has, there, there are four peach trees. 
Last year, one started dropping leaves midsummer. This year, they've started doing that again, and the leaves look diseased. So, what are some leaf diseases of those stone fruits that come to mind? That There's cause that? several different ones that could affect it. So, I, I'm uh, I'm not going to identify that with that description. There's bacterial and fungal leaf spots. So, I would really encourage a sample in that situation. And if you really want to control it. You get on a fruit tree spray guide and there's lots of resources online to help you with that. All right, excellent, thanks. Okay, Kelly, this is actually a critter in a tree question. Okay. <laughs> it's a sap sucker mm -hmm. that damaged a magnolia that's about 40 years old. Anything we do to say, control the sap sucker holes? As a general rule, we don't, uh, rec you don't need to control sap sucker holes. That's a type of woodpecker that's just feeding perfect little holes in a row and they're feeding on the sap. Um, and typically it's more cosmetic, granted it's a wound to the trunk where possibly decay or something could get in there, but uh, just like with pruning wounds, we don't recommend covering them up. Um, you don't want to put a bandaid on it. So, and you really, they're gonna move. If you try to cover it up with something, the sapsucker woodpecker will just move over and, and start on another area. So they're kind of interesting, enjoy them. All right, thanks Kelly. And while you do that, we are going to see who wins the lightning round. <clears throat> Kelly. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> when should people plant their fall garden? It, most people start about late July, but it all depends on what you're planting. Right now, probably lettuce, spinach, uh, radishes, things like that, a salad garden. All right, this is a Blair viewer who says she doesn't think her mums are putting on flower buds. Well, it's probably a later blooming variety. Give it time. All right, this is a UTAN viewer who didn't thin their peaches and they're all walnut size. Is this why? That, yes, you need to thin your fruits in late June. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know when burning bushes begin to burn. When, if, if they're in full sun, when the nighttime temperatures, daytime temperatures are just right and it's not too wet. All right, uh, we have maples turning color already. What is this from? It could be a sign of stress, um, I, environmental stress. There's not much you can do. All right. Um, why are beans not producing? This is an Underwood, Iowa viewer. Okay, again, that's environmental. It's usually nighttime temperatures are too hot or too cool, um, cloudy weather. Nice job. You're gonna give me a bunch of questions that are just environmental? <laughs> <laughs> it's rots and spots. It never works that way. Disease triangle, right? We're environmental. going for it, yeah. <laughs> Number one factor. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, we have a viewer with rust on ketoniaster and one with rust on crab apple. Can they do anything about that? now? Not if it's real severe. You want to do that earlier when the disease first starts. All right. And this is a prairie home viewer who says all of their plums are turning brown and soft. Uh, most likely brown rot. So uh, you'll want to look up uh, brown fruit rot and look for treatment on that earlier in the year. Okay. We have a viewer who says that they have cucumbers and there's little holes with what they're describing as goo coming out of them. Is this pathology or insect or both? Could be either. Right. Maybe even environmental. <laughs> we have a viewer from North Platte who wonders how many leaves of his tomato plant should he remove if it does have blight? And this is from listening to us last week. Well, if you're gonna rogue out tomato leaves, you're gonna wanna make sure to pull out any of those with a blight down lower and make sure those better leaves are, are left. Okay, if a blight is showing up on tomatoes now, is it late blight or heat stress? Well, if, if it was, um, it, it, could be, it could be a blight. It just really depends. And, and in either case, even in stress, you can rogue those leaves out All just right. to remove them if they're, if they're not active. Okay, perfect, nice job. Okay, Bill, you ready? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> maybe <laughs> based on that. Okay, um, this is a Southwest Nebraska viewer who wants to know, is there a recommended mix of grass or grasses? In Southwest Nebraska, I would really like something that's heavy in uh, Kentucky bluegrass this time of year, because um, it's they can handle the drought. All right, uh, we have an Omaha viewer who wants to know, what are the lawn weeds that would be germinating now that need to be treated? Uh, one of the big ones, it would be some of the annual grasses, like annual bluegrass. Um, Hen bit might be a little bit later, but it's gonna be a fall, another one in the fall. Um, if you're worried about that, um, you can use a, a pre-emergence herbicide like Gallery that'll help with those broadleaf weeds and germinate in the uh, fall. All right, is it time to take care of violets and dandelions in the lawn? It's a little early. Let's uh, wait a little bit on that one until it's a little cooler and the frosts are starting to happen. 
All right, this is a Crete viewer who wants to know how to control foxtail in a native prairie without harming the other grasses. I'm gonna pass. <laughs> or well, I don't know what the grasses are in the prairie, so it's hard to say without knowing what's there, what herbicide would be safe, so I'll, that was a pass for safety. That was actually and a I'm good gonna answer. lose again. <laughs> that was actually yeah. a good answer. I mean, that's what it was. I don't, until that was you know a good what the, the You get a point for that. Are. Yeah, I still the lose. The panel is assigning you a point for that one. Ah, oh, thanks. You still lost. Exactly. It's a nice try. <laughs> I always lose. <laughs> nice you won know. once. All right, are you it's ready, Jody? It's hard to Jody? compete with yes. this rig deal over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have uh, we have a viewer who who used seven as a preventative insecticide as a preventative. No. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have a viewer who wants to know they're, they're planning on spraying their bagworms again in two weeks. Is that a good idea? Or no, is it's it not a late? good idea because they are starting to close up right now, and you would need too much probably. So no. I would say no. All right. We have a Loop City viewer who wonders where are the ladybugs. I have seen some, they are in the larval stage, but because we have so many bugs and aphids and sap feeders and small little things, they could be in the soybean fields or up in the trees. I've seen a lot in milkweed too. Okay, <clears throat> lots of viewers are asking about clumps of dead oak foliage. What is that from? Could be a number of things. <laughs> could it be environmental? Maybe. <laughs> How about oak twig girdler? How about oak twig girdler? Oak girdler oak Jelly gets the point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an insect attacking asters. What might that be um, and what to do? Uh, the uh, aster lace bug. Um, you can spray with neem or spray with some water and get those to fall off. I'm a loser. <laughs> See, you lost because you answered two questions. You said what it was, and then you said how to take oh. care of it. So did you, because you said use a pre -merge. We just care too much, Bill. Yeah, we care. We're trying to answer questions. <laughs> you and don't care. We also <laughs> didn't know all the answers were just environmental. <laughs> okay, Lauren Kelly. We, try. we wanted to be like Kelly. Of the week. <laughs> Give yes. Kelly the trophy. Okay. Good. She can set it next to her Plants of the Week. <laughs> okay, so yes, Plants of the Week. I will start with the smaller plant up here, which is a sweet cone flower. It is a type of Rudbeckia, but it's sold as a sweet cone flower. And this, you can see a number of flowers here. <laughs> My trophy. Here, let's just move it in here. <laughs> Got on it. So, and that's one stem. Right, mm -hmm. this is one out of Kim's stem. yard, and yeah. it's one stem. And these plants are quite tall, about five feet tall. And the larger one in the front, I don't have to move down a little bit lower, that is, uh, that one is the Gloriosa daisy. I knew that, and it's also one of the Rudbeckias. And this one is also, Rudbeckia is drought hardy, tolerant, good one, but this one has larger flowers, but a lot fewer flowers um, per stem. And the seed heads up here, these pretty reddish seed heads, are of uh, Dark Towers penstemon. And this is another one of Dale Herman's releases, who Dale Herman, who is with the horticulture department with the University of Nebraska, Nebraska Extension. Um, and it, this is a reddish leaves and it has pinkish flowers. So one of our beautiful penstemons. Excellent. Dale Lingren, I think it was, right? Did I say Herman? You did. Dale Herman was my advisor <laughs> at North Dakota State University. <laughs> Which is why you made that little Freudian slip. Yeah, that's right. Easy to do. I do, I, I've often done that over the years. It's called Dale Lindgren, Dale, Dale Herman. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice combination. All right, thanks, Kelly. All right, we're back to pictures. Let's see, this time you only have three, Jody. Okay. So uh, first one here is, we don't know where they're from. It might not matter. She says there were seven of these near the windows after the rain. And what is it, and is it harmful? Uh, it is not harmful. This is a mayfly. They they're, well, I mean, they, they breed in lakes and streams, but they can be found far away from there as well. They are so cute. You should go up and look at them. They have like actual googly eyes and their front legs look like they're like this. It's pretty neat. The they live for like five minutes. Too. Well, the larval stage is underneath. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're predators under the water. But really? mayflies, yeah, they live for maybe five minutes, some of them, or a day or maybe five days at the most, but like very short lifespans, they don't eat as adults. Well, we had them all over everything at our lake place yep, that earlier happened. this summer. Yeah. Yeah. Why are they called mayflies? This is August. No, yeah. No. yeah. Who knows? Okay. Your second one is a, they think this is a black jewel wing. This is in Bellevue. What is this? Yeah, so they're close. It's called an ebony jewel wing, but it is a broad-winged damselfly. So, you know, the dragonflies and damselflies. So it's a predator 
Um, very beautiful. I've never been able to get that close to one, so that's pretty neat. Very cool. All right, your next one here is a, uh, what is this? Founded <laughs> on their badly chewed geranium in Hastings. Yeah, so this is a, a katydid nymph. So those little bud things sticking out, those little wing buds, um, when it acts, so that means it's a nymph, so it's not an adult. When it's an adult, it has these really long angled wings, and um, they look, people call them leaf bugs, but they resemble a leaf. And if you hear at night, um, you hear like, tick, Go ahead. Tick, tick, tick. <laughs> That is their stridulation. That is their that is their mating call. It's the ticking noise. So you know, cicadas scream, and crickets chirp. Katydids like tick. <laughs> tick. All right. So if you went outside and did that, would you be attacked by katydids? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you try that tonight? <laughs> and here's your here's your last picture. Oh, another which one. Is two. Yeah. Okay. So these are oleander aphids on some type of milkweed, and you can see those um, those balloon-looking orange-ish ones. Those are we call those aphid mummies. So those have been parasitized by a little wasp. Really. It's a circle of life happening on that leaf. That's very cool. All right. Thanks. All right. So we have a yes. What is this? Growing in the lawn. Um, yes. Slowly growing over the years on this one, Bill. Uh -huh. And she wants to know what it is. She has, she wants to get rid of it so she can reseed this fall. This is in Blair. Yep. Um, it looks like nimble will, which is a warm season uh, perennial, unlike crabgrass, which is a warm season annual. So this one lingers, and that's why it's growing and growing. It looks very similar to another uh, kind of creeper called creeping bank grass, but that's a cool season grass. So you can kind of tell the difference easily be in knowing that this will green up very late in the spring and the bank grass will green up really er much earlier in the spring. So if it is nimble will, the applications for that would be actually be in the spring when it's weakest out of winter time. So you'd want to go out with a tenacity or Pilex herbicides or have someone contracted out to do it. Um, if it is bent grass, you saw it green up earlier this spring, then that window for tenacity is actually right now, and you'd make three applications to try to kill the bent grass out selectively. If they're big, huge, broad areas, and you don't care if you're going to reseed anyways, and I don't care what grass it is, then you use a non-selective like a Roundup, round it up maybe two times, you seed into it, the seeding window is now open, and then hopefully you don't have it, you know, come back next year. So that's kind of your treatment options. All right, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lauren, this is a McCook viewer. Uh, they have a pair, and they sent a couple pictures. Here's the, the big old tree, not, and then they sent a close-up of what's going on on the branches on this one. What do we think this is? In the close-up, when I see black leaves, mm -hmm. most of the time that's an indication of fire blight. In the picture, I couldn't see any individual little tips that were crooked or stems that were, were killed, but I, I believe if, if they're seeing shoots in the close-up, Mm -hmm. uh, it's fire blight. If it's just the leaves, it may be bacterial, a bacterial leaf blight. Um, if it's the individual shoots that are being killed, prune back on those branches seven to ten inches below the affected area because it is a bacterial disease uh, and just prune that out. Okay, and then hope for the best, keep that yeah, tree healthy. In the future. All right, thank you, Lauren. You have a couple of uh, damage issues with trees again. Okay. So your first one here, we had, we had a big storm in Lincoln that was a lot of lightning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a river birch, missing bark. Mm -hmm. And she wonders, is this lightning and what happens next? Well, it looks like lightning damage. What happens when lightning hits a tree is it the, actually the water in the cells boil, create steam, and it blows off that bark. And if it's only on one side of the tree, that's a little, and you don't, you don't see splintered bark, or then that's, there's more hope. Um, but what we don't know is we don't know where did that electricity travel? Did it travel down into the roots and damage the roots? Is there more internal damage than we can see? So it's really just a wait and see situation. Um, I wouldn't treat the tree with anything. Just uh, wait and see and provide good growing conditions and hope for the best. All right. And your second one is a three-year-old dwarf peach mm -hmm. that also has trunk damage. Okay. Um, and the growing environment there is a little suspect. Yeah, the grow, it's a, this one uh, might have a harder time recovering, but it looks like a pretty young, it looks like mechanical damage of some sort. I don't know if somebody dropped that brick from above. Um, it's a little high to be weed trimmer damage, and of course you don't have grass around it. 
So somehow it, it, it got wounded. It's a fairly small wound on a fairly sm young tree, so hopefully it'll develop some good wound wood, wound wood and callus that over and recover and do fine. And take that uh, rock mulch away. Yes, yes. It, yeah, it, the wound is probably not as big of an issue as that rock mulch is creating stress, especially for a peach. All right, thanks, Kelly. You know, sometimes we get pictures of damage that isn't the result of either an insect or a pathogen. If you've got cupped or crinkled leaves or your plant just doesn't look healthy, you might have had some chemical drift issues. One of our research projects here on campus has been taking a look at chemical drift issues on pumpkins to help us understand how plants respond to different levels of damage. Here's Sam Wartman to tell us more. One of the emerging issues in horticulture is particle and vapor drift of 2,4-D and dicamba. And that's in part because there have been newly release, released seed traits in corn and soybean uh, that have allowed increased application of those two chemicals. Now these two chemicals have been applied in uh, backyard landscapes for decades. Uh, they're commonly found in broadleaf weed killers. Uh, for things like dandelion and other uh, problematic uh, turf grass weeds. And we're only starting to see them more now because of their broad application across the agricultural landscape. And so what we aim to do in this project is to look at some of the symptoms and injury that are typical of drift of these two chemicals, 2,4-D and dicamba, uh, in part so that we can become better at identifying what those injury symptoms look like. Uh, and also we wanna take those injury symptoms and relate that to potential yield loss in vegetable crops. So for example, if you start to see uh, injury symptoms typical of dicamba, can you expect that you're going to lose a significant amount of yield and maybe you should replant that crop? Or do you ride it out, let the plant recover and uh, still get a harvestable crop off of that? Here I'm going to show you guys some of the typical symptoms from dicamba injury on pumpkins. Because dicamba and 2,4-D, they are growth regulator. So they typically will affect the new growth of plants. So if you look at the new growth, you can see first, you can see some cupping symptoms. That's very typical. Later, you can see some, we call that leaf crinkling. You can see those bumps on the leaves. That is very common on broad leaf, like vine. They typically have the symptoms. Later, you can see, this is our 25% of the dicamba rate we spray on, on our flowering stage pumpkins. Some of the symptoms including the leaf stem and leaf patio epinasty. They kind of show something like the plant just grow horizontally. You can also see some leaf chlorosis on our leaf. That's very typical dicamba injury. For my research, I'm testing two different herbicides, dicamba and 2,4-D. As you can see, this plot is dicamba plot. We also want to take yield data to match with our rate to kind of predict how many yield loss you're gonna expect. This is the plot that we spray with 25% dicamba on flowering stage. We can see a lot of flowering that is lost from herbicide. And we can see there's not so many plants in this plot. There might be one pumpkins per plant. So we typically have five. But if you can compare it to our control plot, we have about two per plant. So we have at least 10 to 12 pumpkins. So there's a huge yield reduction. Even some of the, this is the one we spray at flowering stage. And we also have a plot that we spray 25% when it's at vegetative stage. You can see the symptoms is already recovered because it's seven weeks after we apply. But you can still, if you look down beneath, you can see there's not so many fruit there as well. So now that you know what the typical symptoms of plant growth regulators like 2,4-D and dicamba look like, uh, hopefully you can better identify what that herbicide drift looks like so that you can make decisions about whether or not to replant a vegetable in your backyard or whether or not you wanna go ahead and harvest that. And also maybe work with your neighbors to identify uh, when to avoid and how to avoid uh, some of that drift into your backyard. It is easy to see that if exposed early enough, some plants will make a comeback, but your yield might really take a hit, and that really goes for everything in the garden and the landscape. All right, Jody. 
This is a coneflower question. She hasn't seen any insects on them. She says her black-eyed Susans also have this. What is this and what to do about it? Uh, this is a sunflower head moth. Mm -hmm. All of my coneflowers look like that. If you actually dug into that um, coneflower head there, you would find like probably 20, 30 uh, moth, uh, caterpillars in there. Right now, we're just like printing them off and hoping that if there's any other buds in there that they'll come out. But um, they're migratory moths, and the moths actually lay the eggs in the middle of the night. Okay. So. And your second one is titled Crud on her <laughs> lantana. This is in Wahoo. What is this? Uh, so these look like mealybugs. Uh, I would try to wash those off as much as possible. Insecticidal soap, um, neem oil, things like that. Okay. Bill, um, we, had, we had this set of questions from this viewer in Hornick, Iowa before, but uh -huh. she sent us additional information on it. So okay. this is herbicide that was laid down, um, and this is over a leach field. Mm -hmm. She used her riding lawnmower to apply it. It's pretty thin, and then what's really happened with it in the second picture, you can see what that is. She's wondering, is that herbicide or is that disease? I mean, that? we've seen a lot of these different pictures now over the last couple of weeks, and um, if she's if she's saying like that it was that much herbicide, then that really could be herbicide damage, and it's not going to recover until the weather cools off. Um, if you think it's a disease, it says it's being watered. You know, overwatering right now is not the answer. Usually, rarely is the answer for a bad-looking lawn. So make sure you're not doing that to promote disease. But if you think it is um, a herbicide, you're not going to really see recovery until we get those cooler nights and more ideal weather for for growing grass uh, at this fall. All right, and <clears throat> excuse me, your third picture here is a Norfolk viewer seeded the lawn last August with tall fescue. It was fine until hot, humid weather, sprinkler system, fungicide. So this came to you because Lauren has too many other pictures. Yeah, and this is, uh, <laughs> we, this is one thing Lauren and I were talking about before. Um, we think this could be a couple of different diseases. If it's tall fescue and it showed up when it was hot and humid, brown patch would be something that would be very likely. And, um, you know, we don't want to be too much fertilizer, but at the same time, if that grass isn't growing, our, our latest research is showing that that can also be problematic. So you want to have enough growth that if you're mowing about weekly. If you're mowing less than that, you're probably growing too slow. And if you have to mow more than that to keep up with your clippings, you're probably too, too much fertilizer. So just try to, you know, strive to fertilize to mow once a week. And that's a really good growth rate for tall fescue. All right, excellent. Lauren, you have a question about roses from Philip. Phillipsburg, Kansas. Um, she thinks this is black spot. She was told it was black spot, but she's not sure she agrees. So what, what can we tell her? This is heirloom roses, we, by we the way. We have a picture, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the picture in this, I, I'm questioning if this isn't a virus uh, mm -hmm. because of the pattern on the leaves. If there wasn't any application made, I think that's what it is. Um, I would be careful and make sure you're sanitizing between any pruning if you have other roses. Um, if this is, you have a collection, I, I would consider roguing this one out. Uh, mm -hmm. Anytime we have virus infected plants, the, the management, if you have other plants that they could spread to, which it could spread to other roses, we'd say rogue it out. All right, and, and I think she I will wouldn't follow. wouldn't for it. I think she will follow our advice. Thank you very much. Kelly, you have two fun identifications for your Great. last pictures. <laughs> Great. Uh, the first one is they purchased it didn't have a tag. What is it? Okay. This is uh, Ligularia. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one. Another common name is leopard's plant and it loves heavy shade and it'll take and it needs moist soil. But Ligularia. Excellent. And your last one here is uh, this one came up in a pollinator seed packet. This is a bite Ithaca. Mm -hmm. What okay. is this? This is partridge pea and it's actually one of our native uh, wildflowers. It's a legume so it helps the soil. And it, that the flower is followed by a little tiny seed pod that is a great uh, food source for game birds and songbirds. Excellent, thanks. Well, we have a bunch of announcements of cool things going on in the gardening world, and I think they're all about us this week. <laughs> the first is our Grow Row produce donations, still taking those Tuesdays from 5 to 7 in our backyard farmer garden on East Campus. Our second one is our totals for August in our Produce for the Heart donations, 258.6 pounds from the Backyard Farmer Garden, 91.6 from Grow Row, which is great. 
Our third one is we will be at State Fair Monday this year, August 26th, Q&A 230 to 330, taping from 4 to 5 in the Raising Nebraska building. And I think one more, which is watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on Facebook, Sundays at 6.30 p.m. And it'll be really great this week because it's Tiny Humans in Gardens.